Today we got our next uh, installation of uh, deep plugging device, right? Yeah. So uh, Daniel will be presenting. Uh, we'll try to make this a little bit more uh, for the first second. Don't want to overlap. Uh, so So uh, we're going to cover lossless compression first before coming back to flow models. So Daniel is going to do us uh, a favor of going through the uh, lossless compression part of the lecture. So uh, please come forward to the front uh, or a little bit closer to the mic. So uh, I prefer if people are not sitting all the way in the back, but it might be well. There's only one mic. Okay. All right. So uh, yeah, when we're ready, we'll start. So, yeah, so I'll be presenting about lossless compression. And so what is compression? And essentially, compression is like reducing a number of bits to record a message. And there's essentially two types. One is lossless, and one is uh, lossless compression. So lossless essentially means that uh, when you get the output after compression, you actually essentially want the same uh, input as you put in. And this is essentially what we're going to be uh, focusing on in this lecture, which is lossless compression, where you actually get the same thing that you put in. So um, the place that you probably see compre uh, com compression is probably like when you're zipping a file or in like in many of these multimedia applications like JPEG, uh, MP3, and even communications such as like Skype or fax. Yeah, so one popular uh, place like people discover compression like as like a fictional thing is the iPacker. Has anyone watched Silicon Valley? <laughs> So yeah, basically the, the algorithm they use is the middle out algorithm, if you know what that means. But, uh, but you should definitely watch it because it's pretty a yeah, pretty interesting uh, uh, TV show. So look at that. Yeah. yeah, this is one of the examples where like uh, an actual company called Piper Pi just tr try to do something lo uh, lossy compression. So um, so basically. Uh, is there something called like a universal data compression? Um, basically, it's the idea that if you have like, um, uh, it's the idea that like, um, it, it, the, the proposition is that like, we have no algorithm that can compute, uh, compress every bit string. And the, the, way it's, the way it's proved is that, uh, let's say you have, a, you have some algorithm that can compress every bit string. If you compress one bit string, you get another bit string. And if you keep compressing it, you eventually kind of reach zero. And the problem is that it means that every bit string can be compressed to zero, and essentially it's uh, it's like a it's like a perpetual motion machine. So essentially, it doesn't hold true. So it's a proof by contradiction. Uh, another method is to uh, it's by proof by counting. This one I didn't really get, uh, but essentially it's just that if, if you have an algorithm that can com compress uh, compress all, all of one thousand bit streams. It means that there are uh, two to the power of 10,000 bit streams, essentially because there's two choices for each 10,000 positions. So this means that only one plus two plus four to the two to the power 99 can be encoded with less than 999 bit streams. Like I didn't really get this part, like if anyone wants to help me out. But, so let's talk about this part. Yeah, so 
especially this paradigm related to the taxes. Okay. So um, talking about the third and the fourth line. So uh, hopefully everyone understands because we have a bit in each position, right? It could be set to zero, one, so there must be two to uh, one thousand uh, uh, messages possible. So how do we get to the point where we're looking at this uh, series here, one plus two plus four, can be encoded with 900, uh, less than 999 bits? Okay. Is this essentially saying that this summation is less than this summation, this number? Is that essentially it? Yeah. It's a geometric series, you can sum it. Right. It's into the power power generation. Compression by definition. Compressing um, this string. Um, so I think essentially what we want to do is that we want to contain give the same amount of information, but we want to we want to like reduce the size of it. So I think like uh, we want to kind of represent the same information but have it represented by smaller bits. Is that, is that the thing we want to do? So it's just that uh, when you do lossless compression, you expect to get back to the original size, but you want to store it in a more compact representation. So you have to have some way of representing the, the larger string in the smaller amount of space. Yeah. But I don't really get this line. Why didn't you like if you sum from one plus two to the power two to the power four nine nine k, it's equal to two to the power five. Okay, so that's why I see. Okay, so that's what I did. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, let's not speed up too much. Did everyone follow that? Yeah. Can anyone else explain this uh, again just to, to make it clear? Yeah. I, I actually do know this, but I want to sum this out. So, why do we have a sum? Why don't we start? Uh, this is obviously inductive, right? So, we're starting from a small base type function, just one bit, and then scaling out to. So let's just take a case of let's say maybe two to the power two, right? And what are we getting here? So we have two to the power zero, which is one, two to the power two, which is two, two to the power three, which is four. Sorry, two to the power two, which is four, right? And then you're assuming that it's less than two to the power three. So what does it mean that it can be encoded with less than or equal to that number of bits? So yeah, um, essentially, the, the, 
So if you look at this uh, passage, you can see that like a lot of words aren't like you know, aren't spelled correctly, but it's still you know kind of understand. So essentially, it's saying that you know because we because like there's like patterns and like there's like there's like we can we can't get information from like from like less information we actually need to. So that's why essentially compression uh, compression is possible because we can get the same kind of information from, by just by just like uh, using less data. So essentially, like maybe like um, when you're texting, you kind of shorten things up, but someone can still perfectly understand things. So yeah, so also because uh, because data often have like very sense to regularity, so essentially data has patterns. So because we have patterns, we can kind of exploit them, and that's where we can progress them. If you have random data, you can't progress them because you don't you don't know what's actually coming next it's because it's pretty random. Yeah. Next, I'll talk about um, coding symbols. And so basically, uh, fixed length, variable length, and coupling stories. So, uh, so this is like naive coding, uh, which is like fixed length. So essentially, uh, the ASCII. So essentially, all uh, characters on your keyboard, they all are like seven bits characters. And so, so all of this makes it easy for like trying to figure out what a character corresponds to based on the bit string. But there's no, you can't really expect statistical patterns because they all are of the same length, so you can't really compress them. So yeah. Next, uh, we have a diff we have a different character where the length of the codes are not all the same for uh, different characters or different words we want to represent. So it's just like uh, when you have like you can have like a bit string be like uh, different lengths. But then uh, there's an issue where if you have a like a long string of ones and zeros, how do you know at what point? You start does a new character start or a, an old character ends, and there's two ways to do it. One is to have a stop character. It's essentially like a full stop or like a pause and what score, or just have a general prefix code. So essentially, uh, like after you come to a certain, uh, certain like ones and zeros, you kind of know that oh, I found this character. I found a string in like my dictionary. So I'm going to stop looking. I'm going to look for the next character string. So that's the three things we want to talk about. So yeah. So in Morse codes, um, there's like there's two types of so there's like uh, two for instance ones and zeros. We essentially have like a dot and like long dashes, and so these are like the bits in our system, and the pause is that stop character. Yeah, and in these kind of systems, you obviously want to use characters that you want to use um, patterns or like bit strings that are like kind of shorter or things that are more common. So like vowels like A and I, you can kind of see that they're pretty short because we type them more often and we kind of reserve the longer um, ones for things that we don't might we not might we might not use so often. Yeah. Okay. And they are also uniquely decodable. So can we go back for a yeah. second? Is it clear why it's not uh, prefix three? Anyone can give a quick explanation why this code is not three fixed three. So, so far, uh, A and J are the same Yeah. So after you do dot dash, it's not clear whether you're talking about right. A or J, right? Or, or, or R or E or. So you need a pause character to say, okay, I'm finished with that letter. So you have to waste the whole whatever information to transmit a pause. So now we come to some things, something called prefix free, free codes. So essentially, um, they don't have any pause characters, but because of the because we kind of the way you kind of build them up and order them, um, it's essentially like going down the tree. Like once you like go down the tree. Uh, and you read it, reach a dead end. There's no way else to go, so you kind of know it's kind of unique. So the way the way we kind of do this in is some, with something called binary trees. So we have such that if we go left, it's a zero. If we go right, it's a one. So if you start from the bottom, from the top, if you have some a code called like one or one, you go right once, then we go left once, then you go right once, and you reach the end. So essentially, if you, 
if you keep like if you have like a really long sequence and you keep following the path until you hit, hit like a leaf, um, you reach like a you you reach you reach essentially. And once you reach a leaf, you kind of start the process again. So in that sense, it's actually uniquely decodable. Yeah. So in this in this kind of tree. Uh, <clears throat> So, but then uh, not all trees are equal. Um, so you can see the tree on the left, you need 30 bits, but the tree on the right, you need 29 bits. So the goal becomes how to find, how to create an optimal tree that uh, when you write, when you write like a, some, some kind of message, it will be the shortest possible uh, length, so the shortest possible bit string. Yeah. Uh, I guess you all follow this part. C and A, if C and A is actually not equal to each other. Oh, C and A to each other. C and A. So C and A is just plus. Okay, so if we start with C, um, so that'll be like one, one, zero. So you go one, one, then you go zero. Then you reach something called C, so you get C. If you have A, it's essentially just zero. So you know that, so once you reach C, we know that uh, we have to start a new string. So we go start from the top again, and we go once, so which is zero, so we reach A. It means that we reach something. So that's why we know that it's character string. Yeah, you can try like following the tree and you kind of kind of see that it's actually uniquely from yeah. Because although they might share like similar parts, um, once you like start from the tree top, um, you can kind of see that if you hit the leaf, it's essentially unique. So a quick question, <coughs> if we put a letter somewhere in the middle of the tree, right. that's awesome. what happens? Uh, we misread the characters. Because actually we cover the whole space, I'm not sure that we can, but maybe we cover all the space of the characters if we have got to use the most efficient then if we misplace our cursor, we read nonsense. <coughs> if, if we omit, omit the, the first zero, actually we will get a completely different text. Right. So this is one of the problems with prefix string codes, right? Uh, you, you need to know where you're stopping uh, in order for the next character to come. So if you have some noise in the channel, and you misrepresent something, you can decode a completely different string. Right. Right, so this is a, a big problem. The other one that I was mentioning is that, like, say, if you take a look at the tree on the left hand side, let's say I put the character zero, uh, Z, um, in uh, next to A, right? So on the left, right of A, I put a Z there, right? right? That means when I read a one, I would output a Z, right? But that yeah. means it's not prefix free anymore. I don't know whether I'm stopping at Z or going down to D or I or C or R. So the prefix code means it must terminate. All the leaves have to have annotations, and no immediate node can have any characters. Yeah, I think it's like one of the proofs in the in the towards the end. We kind of like we kind of like add like nodes, but yeah, essentially like they don't have anything in them, so that's like kind of fine. But if you have something that's um, they actually have a value underneath, then they actually is no longer really portable. But like in a proof, we did like some to prove something. We kind of just add um, kind of make it a balance tree, but like just have the once below, like the last letters kept in. Okay. In that case, I believe. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so yeah. So essentially, the goal was to find trees that uh, we can get like the most a shorter uh, message across. And there's an optimal optimal way to do that, and that's called uh, Hoffman's algorithm. So essentially, first you consider the probability or the frequency of each symbol. I in the input. So we start with like one node corresponding to each symbol I uh, with weight PI. And you do this process until like we have one tree from like a range of uh, a range of uh, symbols and their frequencies and probability. So the first step is to 
uh, select two trees with the, the least the smallest probabilities and you add them together and you merge into a single tree and you add the probabilities. And I'll show you an example in the next slide. So as you can see here on the on, on the right, you have a table of frequencies and like uh, characters. And you can see that the the ones with the lowest frequencies are P, D, and the exclamation mark. So let's say we take uh we take in this example six C and exclamation mark. So we start with here. These are both each has a frequency of one. So you add them together, you put them together, and you uh, have you can you can sum the total. So now this 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 tree has a frequency of two. Then the next step is to to find to we we look at the table again. Uh, so now we have like C plus this is two. Next we look at what's the look at the two smallest ones. So in this in this particular example, we chose D and C plus explanation mark to get this part. But you could have east, uh, equally have chosen you know D plus B or something because D is the lowest and the rest are all two, so you can kind of add them together instead. But so now now if you add them together, you get three. And so D plus D plus D is equal to three. Next, you look at the two uh, smallest frequencies, and that's um, B and R. And you add them together, you get four. Then you keep continuing until until you go through all of the uh, the characters in your table, and you have one one single tree. And so yeah, so this will give you the most optimal um, code. So essentially, the the message you send will be like off the shores. Like, yeah, there are a few ways to do it, but I think all of them are equally optimal. Is there anything, any questions? Sorry, optimal? Yeah. yeah, I think there's like a proof. Uh, so they're going to prove like why it's optimal, like somewhere in the next few slides. Uh, and I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll get to that too. Yeah, I, I kind of don't understand it too well, but I hope we can work together. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So essentially, like, yeah, whatever occurs more, it's at the top, so you you can reach it much faster than the ones at the bottom. So I think it's also used in like PDF, JPEG, and a bunch of uh, media compre uh, compression algorithms. So the next part, uh, I'll be talking about theoretical limits. So it, uh, it'll be about why Huffman codes are optimal, uh, and what does the like Shannon's entropy say about like how optimal can we get? Uh, how, like uh, to what extent can we compress a, a bit string? So um, yeah. So uh, so so. Entropy is essentially a, uh, a, me a measure of information. So it's uh, it's the average of it's the average of the amount of information. That's like an intuitive way to understand it. But this is like the formula for uh, entropy. Um, so the first sum leaves the, the the probability of each symbol, and this this term at the back I think is like how much how much how much surprise would a certain symbol have if you were, if it were to actually show up before I actually see it. Yeah. yeah could, would, does anyone know how to explain like what the terms are in entropy? If you could give an example. I mean, this is uh, <coughs> hopefully a basic question for most of you. So um, how can we define the differentiation of entropy? What, what are we looking at? So log of 1 by Txi, or uh, negative log of Txi, basically right. trying to say, uh, uh, it's basically putting the highest premium on the lowest probability, right? because it's basically trying to say that negative log of Txi, because Txi is a variable from 0 and 1, is going to be maximum and Txi is the lowest value. So you're basically saying that uh, one which occurs rarely is the most informative one. Right, and the one which occurs frequently is the least information. So that's primarily the definition of 
information for a given event, uh, information value for a given event, and the entropy is basically measuring what is the expected uh, information given the distribution of the event around this particular time. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I think it's pretty good. So why are we taking a log here? Is there any particular reason for that? Uh, summation, I guess. Is it? Yeah. First, get some there. Meaning we're basically assuming each of them are independent, right? So each bit of information that X I has for an intro product, then it goes along. So, um, so if you look at the, the two examples of, yeah, so so if you have like a distribution where it's like pretty, um, it's pretty equal, you have a higher entropy, and it's, you know, it's pretty invalid, you have a small entropy, you have like, you have a uh, balance of Measuring the amount of information I need to test it to give you uh, a proper coding of the distribution, right? In the event, so I think that's the question. Uh, next, so we have uh, Kraft Macmillan's inequality. So there are two parts to this. The first part is that if you have any uniquely decodable code C, we have this inequality that um, that's. Um, Yeah, we have this inequality that it's uh, the sum of uh, two to the power of negative uh, length of words is less than one. So this term is the negative length of words. So essentially, um, and so essentially, the, the code needs to be large enough to satisfy this inequality. And the the, the other the, the other converse of this inequality, uh, this 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 theorem is that. For any set length, set of length L of the, if, if it satisfies this inequality, it means it means that we have a uniquely uh, decodable code C. Yeah. And I'll go through the proof. So yeah, so this is how much proof of prefix codes. So um, prefix codes and um, prefix free codes are the same thing. Uh, I got confused mm -hmm. at first, but like essentially the reason why we call it prefix code is that because the codes have the property of Having a prefix rather than I thought, it, I thought initially meant that these code had a prefix attached to them, but it's actually like they have the property of a prefix. So for any prefix uh, code C, we we have we have this this inequality, and that's a, that's what we're going to prove. So if you have a prefix code. Then we, we, could, we could build a, a tree that we kind of uh, did in the past, in, in a few slides ago, where we have a, uh, where you can represent, a, uh, represent it as a, uh, there's something wrong with the, So in, in, in the in the first example, like uh, we saw we saw when we drew we drew a tree, we kind of have this tree on the top half. Now we kind of want to expand the tree, and by, by making it like a balanced tree. So if we if we have a we expand to a balanced tree until it reaches like um, the uh, depth of L n. Okay, so if, if we extend to uh, depth of ln, we have uh, two to the power of ln. Then, and okay, so so essentially we have uh, so at each of these nodes, uh, it will be a uh, the depth will be uh, <coughs> uh, so the depth and the length of code is essentially the same. That's the first the first thing. So at, at each at each of these like red nodes, it's essentially equal to um, li, and and you can see we can, we can compute what's the remaining things below 
by subtracting uh, two to the power of ln minus li. So this this one for for each of these, this is what equals to. So once you do that and we kind of sum it all together, we we get this summation. And we know that the the total number of uh, the total number of nodes or uh, the total number of leaves we have is two two to the power of uh, ln. That's like the entire entire tree. And based on this, we can kind of say that because you know um, the the, the, the tree that's not expanded, the tree that's not expanded is actually smaller than the entire balance tree. Based on that, we can do some manipulations and say that it's less than uh, or equal to equal to one. So we're looking at pi two. So essentially, you have uh, for, for any set of length i, uh, uh, li, we, that if this this inequality holds true, we have a prefix code of the same size, okay. such so, that the length. So we go try to go through this. So yeah, the first step is like to consider the. I mean, I can kind of read it out, but I don't know. Yeah, why don't you go ahead and read it out and let, let's all collectively think about how to answer this, all right? So yeah. collective text this time, all right? All right, so consider a full uh, tree of depth LN. For each I, you pick any node of depth LI that's still available, covering two to the power LN minus L1 leaves of the expanded tree. Is there enough space in the tree? Yes, if, yes, this would, this is this is true if this inequality holds true, which, and this holds true because of, the assumption we made. So anyone want to take a crack at parts of this? What are we doing by reading? So for each that we pick. Codes, yeah. 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 So the red nodes in the tree, yeah, are, I think, character. are a specific character that they're trying to encode. So, like the the one closer to the top might be like the letter E, for example, because it's actually the path. Right. So when you choose that letter to be at towards the top of the tree, then basically, I think what the proof is saying is you're covering everything under the subtree. You're making all those nodes underneath unavailable for allocation because it's prefix free, right? Right. You cannot allocate another red dot somewhere on the path downward from that red dot. Right. So if you notice all the red dots here, they're all they don't have another red dot underneath them somewhere in the subtree. Because if that were the case, then you would have a conflict. You would have a prefix that uh, conflicts with the letter character that you were using, right? So I take this capital L as like the size of the vocabulary, the number of items that you're trying to encode. So you're trying to place capital L of these dots, these red dots, somewhere in this complete tree, in such a way that you cover all the leaves. Right? So for example, if you had this, this tree looks like the um, what one, two, three, four, five, uh, level level four, no, uh, depth four, right? Because we 
it's not going to do it to the power tree. And so the depth four tree, then we have a, a total of uh, 16 different child nodes, which means that this particular tree can only put up to 69, right? With a, a uniform distribution, right? But the coding on the tree right now, if we were to take the red one as coding, we can see that this is not uh, a uniform distribution, right? The, whatever is on the right hand side is obviously much more common, but we've taken that as uh, eight, eight units of uh, probability, whatever you'd like to say. So we basically coded only four characters. Yes, right now we're only coding four because we're using those four and it covers the entire complete tree at this point. Right? So the eight bits of probability are not at four on the other side and two on this side. Yeah. And you can see that the, the depth four node, the depth four, the last level is sort of backwards here, right? Because we're not using anything, right? Everyone following? I, and you know, I, I haven't read through the proof either, so I'm I'm just looking at the tutorial that I can. So if you guys have insights to the proof, then we can talk about that. Yeah. You can, anyone on Slack or on the Scribe page can find a, uh, a document on, on this to that up. Go ahead. We're not waiting for anything in particular. We're just saying, you know, if we would like to discuss it more, we can. Uh, if we uh, want to go through groups, uh, otherwise we can let Daniel go ahead. Okay, but the scribe team, I, I guess there are a couple people in the room who are scribing. Uh, you guys can uh, try to pick up uh, any links or documents that could help a reader try to understand this uh, group. Or in a college setting. Okay, and those of you with your, your computer in front of you, you're going to look at whatever they pick it up. And this is the whole point of having a scribe team and, and, and using Slack or, or using the Google Doc is to help uh, you know, um, supplement what our lecturers are trying to do. It's uh, tough enough as a lecturer, right, to keep the dental material so that's tough as well. Alright, so the consequence of these uh, two theorems that we get the we got Shannon's theorem. So essentially, it's saying that there's a lower bound on the average code length. So we have the entropy is less than the average code length. So L A of C is the average code length. And the proof is that um, so we have so we have uh, entropy on its average code length. So we so we kind of formulate this from so we get entropy from the entropy equation we saw last time. Then we subtracted by the average code length. The average code length, we can get it, is given by this formula, the probability of xi times the length of that specific code word. So yeah, so this was missing a slide. Um, so you go to the next slide. Um, so if you, if you replace this definition, you kind of kind of put it together. Then in this line, um, in this line, we, 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 can, we can write out uh, we can write this, we can write uh, li out as this thing, which then equals to this particular, this uh, logarithm. So I get that part. So uh, log two of log two is equal to one, so you can write it out. Then based on a log, we can kind of put L1 uh, on top of uh, two, right? And next, because we have a negative log, you, you kind of put it, you, uh, you kind of like put it down. Yeah, so basically in this in this step, uh, we bring the, kind of bring it up like this, then we kind of put it together. And the last step, we use something called a Jensen inequality. It's essentially saying that um, if we bring the log out, it will be, if, if, log, uh, if we bring the, the log outside, of this whole summation, it will actually be uh, bigger. And it's essentially based on this idea, but I'm not quite able to like properly do justice to it. So we can 
if you want to take it as it is that this thing holds true, uh, we get this part. So I think uh, there are many times we apply Jensen's inequality for these types of conditions, right? So Daniel has already made the diagram actually on the right hand corner, right? Um, where you're illustrating that the, um, the, the right hand side is the upper bound, and we're right. just uh, uh, showing that the, the summation is uh, less than the average. Right? So that's the thought in Then we can basically, you know, we cancel these two terms out. Potentially, you get this this inequality. Then we we know from the previous uh, this this proof that that we have a unique rule. Uh, we have a prefix code. We have this inequality. So then we kind of plug that in. Get less than we get which is less than or equal to one. So then we get that this whole this whole uh, expression is less than or equal to one. Therefore, you get that the entropy is uh, so this. You get that there's a lower bound on the average code then, and it's, and it's bounded by the entropy of x. <coughs> yeah. um, so that's the converse. So, so this is the proof that the optimal prefix code is within one of the entropy. So it's so the upper prefix code can be given by the, the optimal and average of the prefix code can be given by um, h of x plus one, and that's. This is the proof for it. So, so we just, so in this case we assume that the length the 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 length of a length of a length of a character or like a, something we represent is given by this this expression, and this is the upper bound on it. So um, I think like um, I think like you explained earlier that this is about how much information a particular uh, word would contain or like. And yeah, it corresponds to how much how much uh, information like xi will contain. And so, because we we define it as such, we, we can plug it in. We can plug it in, and we can have because it's bounded by the upper bound. We can have that it's less than this expression. And and I think and, and like using log rules, you kind of bring the negative up, put it up. Then you can kind of get this expression. Then you get it equals to one, and because it equals to one, uh, it satisfies the condition that uh, it satisfies this condition that we've proven uh, in the past. That it, it satisfies uh, part one of Kraft Macmillan's uh, inequality. So essentially, that in the previous code, we have to satisfy this thing. So if we if we do indeed choose this. Definition as the, the length of a length of a uh, length of a word or a character, uh, we do get that it's satisfied. So now we have to determine what the well, what the what the expected code length of, of this code is. So we have the average code length, and it's uh, given by this expression. Then that we replace li with our uh, what we've chosen to define as the the length of a specific character, then because it's because uh, it's because you have the upper bound, you kind of write it. It's less than or equal to one plus this expression. Uh, then because one's constant, you kind of pull it out, and we have this expression, and we can recognize that mm -hmm. this expression is equal to the entropy that we've defined before. So therefore, we get that the average code length if we do define it. In this in this manner, we get it's one plus the entropy of x. So, a question for y'all: What what does the one represent? What, what, why are we why is it a one? Are we talking about characters or bits or what? What what's this meaning of one? It's a bit, it's a right? Bit. It's a yeah. bit of information. So because we had this upper bound, this uh, you know, this the upper bound bracket, right? We have to transmit either information or no information. As soon as we transmit the information, then it's gonna be one thing. Right? Because we don't have any quantum smaller than one to transmit the information. Right? Mm -hmm. 
right? So as soon as we, we get rid of that rounding bracket, we're adding one to it. That's why we have that up top. Less than or equal to on the second line, that's the second bottom part. But so obviously that's not a tight bound, right? You actually need less information than the whole bit. But um, because you don't have a choice, you can either transmit information or not, you have this upper bound. So this is the proof that the Hoffman codes, uh, which is essentially Hoffman's algorithm. So the way we kind of define, you know, we get the, we get two nodes. These are like two characters are like that. Are the lowest probabilities of frequencies that we kind of build together a tree. We kind of we here, we here in this slide they're going to prove that these codes are indeed the optimal suffix code. So this is a proof by induction. So so first we uh, so we call the two lowest probabilities on two lowest frequencies in our like our, our table. Symbols x and y, and we assume that optimal prefix codes have two leaves in every lowest branch. So, essentially, uh, we want we, we're talking about trees that look like this versus trees that look like that. So, in the lowest branch, we always want to have two, but in other branches, we we don't have more than two. And so, it says that we 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 without loss of generality, we can have that x and y be part of the same parent. This, Essentially sharing the same parent, and we can like kind of switch them around at, at, at any position. Um, it would it wouldn't matter. It would be the same thing. So, no matter what the tree structure is, the additional cost of having this particular uh, these particular leaves um, x and y added, rather than simply having something like um, c and maybe like z versus this example, the, the extra cost of having to add this is. P of x plus P of y. Or I can think of it as like, you know, in the last example, it was like frequencies, so like one plus one or something. But we can also use probabilities. So then the Huffman, the, the, the n symbol Huffman code tree adds this minimal extra cost to the optimal n minus one symbol Huffman tree code, which we've assumed that's uh, optimal by induction. And yeah, I don't fully understand it, but I think I kind of got the gist of this uh, thing. If anyone wants to add on to this, I'll be grateful. I think we'll, we'll move a little faster. Yeah, here. yeah, because that takes. Yeah, I think I think it's too much time. So yeah, this is a quick recap, I guess. I can just skip this. Uh, entropy of the English language is essentially um, channel, like based on how um, basically had an experiment where have people try guess the next character. And you know, eighty percent of the time, people uh, eighty percent of the time, people have like only needed one 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 guess to guess the next character, and so on and so forth. So essentially, it's estimated that the, the entry of the English language was well one bit per character. Okay. So next, we're having coding considerations. So essentially, so um, what if we model which using p hat instead of p? So what if we use uh, p hat to construct the code? So p hat is some, I believe, like p p of i is the, the true or observed distribution, and p hat is what we kind of theorize the distribution to be. And we kind of, if we if we use p hat for this, uh, we can kind of split it up. Yeah, we can we can we can we can have this. So basically, these two are like uh, equal. These two are equal, and it's essentially it's equal to zero. And if you combine these two parts, you get this expression. And you get left over this expression, which is the entropy of P. And on the left, you're left, you're left with something called Kubrick, uh, Kubrick Lickel divergence. And yeah. So do I have to go more than this, I guess? Is there anything I have to clarify? So does everyone know about Kale divergence? Anyone want to give a, a definition for what it is and why it's an important, um, it's an important concept to get? I think this is worth discussing at this point. It doesn't need to be. So 
So this is a kind of distribute uh, like distance between like a certain distribution and another distribution. So in this case, the uh, case divergence between P and P have this uh, like distance between the actual data distribution and the estimated right. distribution. So our actual distribution is on P, right? Our empirical or observed distribution is on P hat. So hopefully they coincide, but when they don't, then they measuring that distance between the KL divergence. Yeah. So could I call KL divergence the difference between our approximation and the actual information? Yeah, I think that's an appropriate way to characterize it. Okay. Yeah. Say that's how far off my empirical estimation is from the real distribution. Yeah. <coughs> Well, I don't think we're measuring it per se. We're just saying how bad is our approximation, right? So we don't know the actual distribution. Like we, we had talked about in the previous lecture, right? Um, we, we, we do many times don't know the true distribution, right? We're, we're just trying to characterize how bad uh, your approximation is. So I thought there are cases where we do know the actual distribution, but because the actual function of it takes so much data, we can compress it, make it simpler. So in that in at that point you do know the difference. So then you could measure the scale that then you said. Sometimes we will know, but uh, I think yeah, we've discussed a couple of times. Uh, in, in many cases we won't know the true distribution. And um, you know, we, we are applying the inductive bias, uh, sorry, the inductive assumption that when we try to do things well on the training data set, that we will actually do well on the test. So um, we, we try to do things well on the, the, the observed distribution, then it would, should hold well for the test distribution too. So KL is uh, also really interesting because it, it is uh, um, asymmetric. It's not a symmetric value difference. Um, so that's a, another property you have to watch out for. Although many people use it symmetrically, I think the average is always the same. So what if uh, P of X has high entropy? So if, you have, if something has, uh, if uh, distribution has high entropy means that we, on average, we have a long code net. So, so the way you can decrease entropy is by considering context. So essentially, if you consider like, um, if, if we use context, we can kind of like, you can kind of like uh, have less information, less. Um, can kind of like uh, we can kind of like give more, get get more information for like less amount of bits. So, so this is like by using conditional entropy. Um, so this is. Wait. Um, yeah, I'm not super sure how to explain this. Do you want me to just go ahead or try? You guys want to take a shot? Anyone want to say why context is helpful here? Well, this essentially, like, if you, if you look at this formula, you can kind of see that it's actually, like, smaller than h of x, which we can, we can kind of write it as. Why would having the context Yeah, just an uh, informal one. You don't have to make it formal. I yeah. mean, the map is already there. Yeah. Yeah. You need punctuation. Then we have the context, like uh, when it comes to conditional symmetry. We know that the uh, event is more solvable, so the information uh, improves with less. So that's why we have conditional symmetry. Something like when I say the bus is fast, you take more information process what pass is. If I told you that if I tell you that I buy a computer the bus is fast, you know which bus it is. Because the context is kind of generated somewhere else, but you need this extensive information. 
So let's paraphrase, right? So the idea is that the context is, is uh, constraining the amount of events that are nearby, right? So instead of having a whole spectrum of things un, un, unconditioned, you're conditioning it on the context. So then the space of probabilities for what follows afterwards is much smaller. And that means uh, those events become more probable as the entropy drops. Right, so then you, you have to know the context, right? So it presupposes that you have a context. Yeah, so the question is whether, like, you can see that the, the Huffman code uses, um, so the Huffman, the, um, the average code then is like h of x plus one, simple on average, but like, you know, plus one sounds small, but it actually could be a lot, especially when you have a entropy that's very small. So in this case, if we have the distribution, we have an entropy that's like 0 0.6. And, you know, if you, if you still add like plus one, it possibly, if you apply this, uh, if you apply the, the same uh, Huffman code, we'd still get plus one. But essentially, the thing is that because of entropy is so small, this plus one is actually like a a huge factor so we want to find like a so it's essentially still it's, it's almost double of like the, the the lowest bound that we can have, have. so we kind of want to find like a, even a better way to kind of like um, uh, kind of a better way to like um we can, we'll kind of find like a like a better code form for this expression and so the way to kind of do it is using something called run length coding essentially we don't like um, we, we don't <coughs> code to each specific character, but like sequences of characters. So one example is using a fax machine. Um, so we can see like, um, so having only one pixel of like white is like, it's much less likely than, you know, having three, um, three pixels of white, for instance. So but by like combining our pixels together and telling you not that the next pixel is white or the next pixel is black, we kind of tell um, how many white pixels or black pixels we have. You know, by kind of putting, by kind of putting through a sequence like longer strings, we can kind of we are able to like have a we can we can have, we can have like a much uh, better uh, much better code length, I guess, because it means that you can kind of play the play the plus one less frequency by like bunching things together and like doing things in batches. So yeah, I guess I can kind of skip this. Thank uh, Daniel. You want to use this deck or you want to use uh, your, you can just get it up. So for the next part, we have our uh, arithmetic coding. So it's just uh, another way of doing compressions. But this time, it's it's unlike a, unlike a half uh, Basically, basically for this, how do I uh, compare? So if you want to encode this um, AAB, for example, so first um, with this probability, so the first since the first character is A, um, we are now um, conditioned on this uh, space. So our next character will be will be this. Yeah. So we do it accordingly, and and finally, so since we have A, then we have B, then we have B, right? So finally, our last A. So we can just send this interval over as our uh, compressed format to represent AAB. Because everyone convinced that, that this, uh, this interval is able to represent this. Okay. Right, so, okay, so we realized that um, 
these intervals, the numbers here, are actually floats. So we will need a way to express this interval in, in a finite number of bits. Right, so the next slide shows this. So how, how are we going to do this? So we basically find um, okay. So we find bits that when these bits are rounded up by extending once we find so let's say we put a one, 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 two finally. This this number still falls within still falls within the interval. So we say that this interval can be represented with this. So if, if we only have three intervals, this, this, and this, if we only have three intervals, we see that we only need a maximum of two bits to represent the three intervals. So we can represent it in zero, one, or one, and one, one. Right. Okay, so um, this part I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what this part is trying to say. I guess we can, I guess it's trying to, um, because it says that there's a naive attempt and a mistake, so I'm not sure. It seems to me that it's the same attempt that they're doing. So I'm not very sure about that. So it describes very well. But if anyone has any input, how I interpret this is that from this naive attempt, we have a maximum uh, code length of HI plus two. This is how I interpret this slide. I'm not sure what exactly in the second. Does anyone have a different interpretation of this or? So I think the main problem with the naive attempt is that that's what they say here. Um, that naive attempt is not a pretty big code. It's uh, not a pretty big code. So, um, so the new attempt that they try to do is to observe the plane. That set of code is this thing. Right? So that means that um, I don't know what to do. But the thing is, in this uh, second example, right, they also changed the range. So it's not exactly the same example as previously. Yeah. And so I'm not exactly sure. And in the video, um, it's uh, quite touch and go on this part as well. Intervals are are this are this uh, intervals. So it's are this intervals. So so this is one possible interval. This is another possible interval. And then maybe if you have another another box here, right? This this is another possible interval. This is another one. So you have all these possible intervals. So what is the number of bits which you can use to express all these possible intervals for a uh, for a string of length two length four? But I think you were saying something else. You were saying that once the the intervals on the first half in the naive are larger than the ones on the Is that right? Yeah. Well, because if you had the naive at first, the next line, uh, you would just the intro with like three equal size intervals. Then 
All right. Yeah. You looked at the, the binary tree building that we saw in the previous right? So you can see, for example, in the uh, at the first naive attempt, right? You have your first interval from zero to point three three, right? And that is strictly larger than zero to two point five. Uh, 0.25, which is the one, the corresponding example down below, right? So there's, so there's this. This this one is strictly bigger than this one. This one is strictly bigger right. than this one. And this one is strictly bigger than this one. So there's no ambiguity in coding it like this because um, these are a subset of the ones up there. Right, but the ones at the bottom are are powers of two, and they exactly correspond to the length of the code. Right, so uh, zero zero is um, basically of length two, so it can code one fourth of the interval. So that means uh, they're using here to represent the first one quarter. Right, and one one is the last quarter. Right, so you go one and then one to the right of the tree and to the right of the tree again. Getting the last one fourth, so that's 0.75 into one, right? And then you have this middle interval from 0.5 to uh, 6 to 5. So go one to the right and then to the left, and then you're representing that one. Does that make sense? Do we need to draw it, or you guys can pictorially get it? I'm, I'm worried we're going to run out of time. Uh, I'll go ahead and draw it, but uh, maybe you can go ahead and. Okay. Okay, so for this um uh interval shredding, we have to encode the entire um, we have to encode the entire shred into an interval before we send it across the one shot. So actually that's what the first problem is. And um, the second problem it assumes it, it assumes infinite position because it assumes that for an infinite length string we can split the intervals forever. Okay, so this uh, right, so this slide this slide says that um, since you have conditional probabilities such as this, this right, you can just use an auto encode uh, uh, auto regressive model uh, as taught in the previous uh, lessons. So you can just use a proper regressive model, but you have to have this uh, neural network present in both the, the thin side and the, the compression and the decompression side. So both of them can understand this uh, conditional probabilities. So, um, so previously we have uh, the static model, but we have covered this and this. So now um, the next one will be this uh, LZ. LZ algorithm. So I'll, I'll just explain it with this slide. So for this, so the LZ algorithm, basically the main idea is that if you have repeating chunks of substrings in your whole string, you don't have to, you can basically say that uh, this string repeats this number of times. You don't have to say, let's say you have AB, AB, AB. You can just say AB repeats this number of times. So basically you can press the information. That's, that's the main idea of it. <coughs> Okay, so so for the first um, this first number, this first number it represents the steps backwards. How many steps backwards do you have to look for the start of the pattern? Then this one is the The symbols in the pattern, and this is just the next, the next character after the pattern. Okay, so let me let me go through with you this uh, three to five example. So for the first for the first example, C A, <coughs> and there's nothing before it, so there is obviously no pattern before it. That's why you get zero, and there are no patterns before it. That's why you have zero symbols in your pattern, and the next character that you want to encode uh, in your in your code is A. So you have this. And for the next line, 
you look forward in time, right? So you can store this uh, four characters in your in your temporary memory, and you look for and you look backwards, and you say that hey, one step back, I have a, which is the start of my pattern, and in this pattern, my pattern is now a, right? And in this pattern, it has one symbol, and it repeats, right? So a repeats. In this four character, a repeats. This a repeats one time. Right, so there's one one step backwards, and in this pattern there's one symbol, and the next character after the pattern is C. That's why you guess. Okay, so for the next for the next one, you again store these four store these four characters in your memory, A A C A, and you look backwards in all your past history, and you see that hey, I have I have this this chunk. Okay, it's definitely not this one. So you have this chunk, which is your pattern that repeats here A A C A. So you so you say that hey, I look the start of my pattern happens three steps in time, three steps backwards. So one step, two step, three step, and my pattern contains four symbols, right? And at the end of my pattern, it's a B. So you have a B there. And and we notice here that it is okay to have overlaps. In this case. There's an overlap of A between the, the past pattern and the next pattern. And that is okay because in our code we actually we actually encode this information as well to show how much overlap there is by, by saying that we look forward three steps in, we look backwards three steps. Backwards and our pattern contains four symbols. So therefore there's one overlap. So there's no uh, ambiguity in this. Right, okay, so for the next example, now after B we are at C and we store this four symbols. And we look backwards, one step, two step, three step. We see that C A B is a recurring pattern C A B. So similarly, three three, and the next one is A. And the next one, here's another um, interesting example also. So we are looking at this, and we look backwards, and we see that A. And here our, although our pattern. Uh, starts one step back. Our pattern is not just A alone, but it's A A. And it, and it overlaps with A. That's what we have here. Uh, yeah, okay, so basically let's search for this. Yeah, oh, okay, we, we cannot have just A in our pattern, because if we have just A in our pattern, right, we, it's a waste of it. So, because we have to have another another row, right? If we do if we do one one C, oh sorry, it'll be one one A. If we do one one A, then we will have another row where we have to do one one C. Right, because I don't get it. So this is that's why we don't do this. We only have A in our pattern, that's why we have A in our pattern, so we can do one one. Anyone else? Yeah. So this is this is the end. There's, there's nothing else on this. So LSB compression is really cool, I think, because uh, it's basically it takes it's adaptive. It's adaptive to the data that you're compressing on the fly. Instead of using Kafka encoding or anything like that, just looking at a dictionary of fixed information, it is adaptively deciding what to encode based on what is already in your home screen. Right. So basically, what you Previously compressed tells you how to compress things in the future. That's exactly auto regression, right? The whole point is to take what uh, you've already seen and use that data distribution to predict, to generate, or to compress what's going to happen in the future. Right? So that's why we cover, I think they decided to cover LZ, right? It's a really cool algorithm. Um, I don't know whether you're old enough to remember the days when we didn't have LZ. When it came out, it was a big deal because it was able to compress things a lot better, right? So, uh, zip encoding is one of those, right? That was utilized in that machine that is all sensitive to the data that you're compressing. So, before everyone was saying, oh, you have to write a dictionary, you have to have a copy, you have to know the 
you need to know the distribution in advance. And what they said is forget that, you build the distribution on the fly based on the data that you're looking at. That's really cool. Possibly stuff question, but this is, what if it's a clear pattern and it just keeps going one by one? Right? Yeah, if there's no pattern, you're in trouble, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's just like the case where we were talking about when Daniel came earlier and said, if you're trying to encode a picture that's random noise, so you're in trouble because your compression is likely going to be bigger than the actual original image, right? Because uh, you can't find any regularity in this kind of right? But most of the data that we look at it has some type of um, uh, regular um, natural pattern. Therefore, it uh, compresses well against itself, right? Some type of fractal pattern or something um, within the data. Okay. I think the whole idea of lossless compression is that your data can't be random. Because right. if your data is completely random, you cannot have that one to one matching, right? So, oh, yeah. Yeah, so the assumption is that the data follows a certain pattern, so some uh, some options are not possible. So your your space is actually smaller, and you have redundant information in your data, which you can which you can remove. That's why you can compress the data. Uh, yeah. I was wondering because you know it's possible that it may not be random, but there's just not much to compress, so it's very so this should ring a bell for anyone doing machine learning, right? And, and supervised learning. General, you need to have a pattern, right? There's no pattern, there's nothing to predict, right? So there's, there's, that, that, that's the end of the game, right? So there must be some pattern to do compression and there must be some pattern to do prediction. This, um, you know, the no free lunch field. I think one limitation of this is that <coughs> since it can only look uh, or take three steps in time, Right. So your pattern can be a maximum of four symbols long. So, so why would we set uh, this question will all be on the floor, right? Why would we set the window size to a certain amount? What What's the benefit of using a larger window or a smaller window? The larger window can spot larger patterns. Yeah, it could store a larger pattern, right? So that could be a benefit. Right, so I can encode a longer string with even fewer bits. Right, but what's the downside of having a large window? Uh, if, if we set the larger like window, then like difficult. The only a few like pattern uh, can be observed in the data. Okay, it's also going to be more less time efficient. I have to scan a larger window every time. Right, so there's always this trade off, right, between the amount of things that you store and, and how frequent they are. So just like when we got back to puff encoding, we said uh, common events we want to store with less bits, and uh, infrequent events, rare events with high entropy, we want to store with longer bits. Right? That's the whole premise of compression. Right. So when we are trying to select the window size, that also has a trade-off. So uh, let's thank parents. Right, now we have everything. So we'll take a five minute break, okay? and then we'll have Elise uh, present the next lecture. That's on the other side of the
Okay, everyone. Uh, let's pipe down. Sample the actual data point, right? And 
that it's not generating anything. I was just sitting back what you fed in as a right? So then you, you won't be able to do that. I forgot what the lecturer said uh, about the image of the right. I think this was the was it the sampled image? Yes. So it's yeah, a mean, basically, the left image is a mean image, remember, it's here, right? So basically, the, the mean is pretty much equal to the bar score at the position. Yeah, the bar is the real image. Yeah, the real image, right? And then because of the Gaussian distribution, you're sampling around the noise element. That's why you're getting uh, something that looks like the real image just to come down.
up on that last part, and we reach out what we learned last time. Eugene presented, so I'm hoping that somebody else uh, got some of it or has watched the lecture. <coughs> uh, so, like uh, the first image uh, said, is going the data uh, itself, the uh, probability density of the initial data. And uh, then the flow is that the function, uh, which is actually a identity, uh, like the function that is like uh, changing the distribution in such a way that it's same because it's before training. We are doing, not doing any uh, uh, other transformations. But uh, after training, the flow changes to a function uh, that uh, changes the uh, distribution. And after the training, we have a distribution of like the second distribution called J. And you see the flow, uh, the function of the uh, graph of the flow has like a peak. So it is an increasing function. And the peak happens because there are two cluster centers in the initial uh, training data. One, the cluster centers here are circled. So when we hit that cluster center, uh, we can see a, a rising flow function. Then again, when we uh, hit another cluster function, cluster uh, part, like cluster density, then there's another small peak uh, near to the edge. So there are two peaks in the flow function because of this rising cluster. So that transformers transform to there like one drop, uh, one rise and drop, then uh, the second rise and drop in the next uh, distribution. Okay, so I mean you can circle those on the, the second distribution. Uh, the, the one on the, the, the blue distribution, right? So I think um, I forgot your name. Uh, Amit. Amit is saying, yeah, I mean, you see the two hump on there, right? So you're trying to get replicate a Gaussian distribution uh, after training, right? The whole point was I mean, you get a Gaussian distribution and then you can sample it. Also, you see this linear transformer, transformation is actually. Uh, increasing the uh, distribution space, like in, instead of like having a zero to one, like standard normal distribution, we have a different distribution where, where that expands to a much higher uh, values than the standard normal. I think the highest value is just when, when you want to do the experiment, it's like for a bunch of Yeah, count. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yes. Before the normalization. Yeah, before. So you did go back to the uh, there may be some comments about this thickness of that little bump in the flow graph. Is that how it represents the thickness here which was in the position A so far? Oh, okay. the middle one. You suddenly like raise your other point. Represents this particular. I think that's the point you were trying to make. The steepness of this particular original distribution is represented by the steepness of the slope of the flow. Right. Do you remember what that is about? It's about steep and drop drops. The flow that you see there is nothing from X, right? Yeah. So if you look at X, where we take a square of negative two zero. Uh, Yeah. 
same happens here. Again, when we approach zero, then it decreases for a while, then it increases and takes it again. Then after that, it just falls. So it's like kind of representing that data uh, distribution pattern to distribution. to make uh, this top two graphs. Okay. Uh, this top uh, blue graph looks like this one, right? The whole point. So we've got this big mess sitting up here. It needs to get shifted somewhere. We're going to put it somewhere over here, right? This is what you were saying, that this top here is representing that push of this mass distribution. So just to be clear, that, that middle column is basically put a transformation function on um, you know, one, one density function on top of the top. So I think we also made some comments about the gradients of the equation for them. Yeah. About how the flow function is very sensitive, but suddenly you improve the gradient of the other one at the top. We just sort of really comment that the identity function is based on top, not really sensitive. Kind of steepness means it's learning faster and physical portions of the distribution. Whereas otherwise, uh, that graph doesn't look much. Yeah, because again, if you go to the right part of it, it goes up and then it becomes almost like a flat. Right. The gradient is kind of strong. But the last, the last two is kind of even flatter. Okay. It's, yeah. it's kind of trying to, I mean, it is. Okay, well, try to make right. something with the sensitivity of the functional space. The gradients are deeper in certain parts and from the they can learn better and better. Okay. Uh, okay, hopefully we're getting that more or less. Any questions? It's good to clarify. I think some of us have it, uh, but many of us maybe like got lots of question marks sitting on top of our heads. Does anyone have like a high level intuition about why we're doing this? Is that clear? No, I, I see a couple of heads. I asked that. Uh, uh, I'm just Uh, we basically have two operations that we want to do inference and compassion, right? Inference says for uh, a given x, is what, what's its likelihood, right? Sampling says uh, given the distribution of the floating, go pick out a point, right? And that point could represent, you know, a piece of text and an image that's generated as a piece of whatever, right? So uh, we've seen in both models that we presented so far that one operation is fast and the other is slow. We said at the beginning, our holy grail of this is to take both operations twice. Right? So, how do you want to um, say uh, again why, why we're doing this mass of the problem? So, like for the left column, we have to have some more electron based for the previous operation plan to be small. But when we have uh, both, uh, we can just make it.
context to your uh, context. So, so that was a special uh, process, but how uh, you can just like uh, take the execution of the grandma and put it on the right hand side, like all the X values that correspond to execution B and N. And then uh, the X values you found uh, will just put the inverse function of that row and it will directly give us the So we saw this even in the first lecture that uh, we, when we were putting in the neural network, we have to do the serial sequence, right? So the whole point of overflow is just just do all of them simultaneously. So you just do one one pass and you get your entire sequence. So I sort of had a recall about the Right, is actually 
Just the naming is enough. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. I, I don't think it's this. It's like a noise is a like a correct order to it. This is just just a like function to like a max of from some like a true data. I think it's called noise because it means nothing without the ah, okay. <laughs>
uh, to another distribution of our choice of our choice because we want to sample from this distribution so we want a distribution that we really understand that we can easily sample from so that's the reason we choose like a uniform of gaussian and they just call it noise but uh, it's just representation so uh, representation means like without the original data this representation doesn't mean anything so that's why i think they call it noise and now uh, so uh, this is this is the uh, part where like they are doing for one dimension now if we convert the same problem to a high dimension then uh, what uh, like we want that uh, we have a very high dimensional images and uh, so inference part is just like uh, that function that we are training that is inferring the representation for us and then sampling we are sampling from this representation uh, to our back to our images and like as prof explained a uh, little uh, before that uh, we can easily do through like a uniform distribution or a gaussian distribution and like we choose a random number and we take uh, the inverse cumulative distribution function of it and so that gives us the actual uh, point in the true data distribution right so that's exactly what is happening but uh, now we come to heuristics now like we want to train this uh, uh, flow or uh, like uh, that uh, flow needs to be trained and uh, and there's one thing like one intuition that uh, uh, that needs to be clear that like the flow the flow will be such that uh, it is actually uh, it is that it is actually like it in we can actually get an inverse cumulative distribution function from the flow right so it, it the flow has to represent a, represent a cdf that's how we can get a icdf from that so uh, uh, so few slides back uh, they have like explained that process here uh, why it is a cdf but due time so i have to like skip those parts now coming to my parts like from slide 70 now Uh, this is exactly the process they are describing like so what how do we uh, like convert use this flow models to sample uh, so transform the database to reason uh, to a best distribution which is the representation uh, that we are getting for p of j then we are uh, like sampling by mapping from j to x to a inverse flow which is actually uh, shown here yeah this is inverse flow and the cdf is a flow from data to uniform 0 to 1 so what they are saying that this is a like cumulative distribution function and it will be a monotonic function and between 0 to 1 with the probability some of the probabilities cannot be more than 1 and it will be always like uh, cannot be negative also uh, because uh, like even if we have a uh, like very not likelihood that is always the probability will be zero so it's between zero to one now uh, so there are two benefits they are giving uh, like uh, this is like gateway to architectures for high dimensional data we explained that and general generalized to arbitrary best distribution because uh, we can like uh, in the cdf we can pick any point and it map to it will map to uh, if you draw a vertical it will map to that data point now so how do we do this process now normally uh, like uh, normally when we have a probability p of x and we this is the best probability that the representation we get after training a flow model so p of j and this volume d j and volume d x is for like a high dimension uh, so if it is a one dimension we we'll simply say that d j by d x so such a high dimension that's why we are adding this all part now uh, is it actually transforms to this uh, representation here is called uh, yeah it's called a uh, uh, probability or uh, uh, pj like in the representation distribution we are getting is to uh, the pro pj there and the determinant of dj by dx now what is dj by dx Okay, so 
when we have an arbitrary transformation, right? We have a space, and we are doing any arbitrary transformation to like maybe rotate or like do some nonlinear transformation uh, transformation in the space. Now, we, if we like zoom into very close point in that space, uh, the transformation is always locally linear. Like what? What do I mean by locally linear? Like if there's a function f1 that is transforming a space, then if like df1 by the part, uh, like the point or the basis vector it is transforming, if you check at the very for a very small change, the transformation is always linear, right? Yeah. Oh, no, no, sorry. Okay. So if like we have d delta x approaches zero. The transformation, uh, transformation will be uh, like locally linear to that point. Now we take the determinant. We take the determinant because it captures the volumetric information of a transformation. Like uh, determinant is like uh, if you remember Wikipedia definition correctly. It's like gives the parallel of pipette in the n-dimensional space, which gives us the transformation, like transformation of a volume in. Uh, one n dimensional space before transformation to after transformation what what is a new volume now uh, also the uh, one thing we have to uh, we show that the volume can increase and decrease so we have to in this case we have transformed in such a way that the volume should increase like why that like for example uh, this such in the lecture video they have also explained this like if x x is a small point before transformation in a uh, high dimensional space the transformation j should represent a big space for that like we transform in such a way that this x here is represented represented in a much uh, bigger space so that when we do sampling that is the in inverse function so that we can is like Easily sample x, right? Like if this space, let's say this space is smaller than this space, then the sampling will become difficult, right? Because uh, there will be a much random chance that we miss x, right? But if if we increase this space after we represent through the flow, then there is a much bigger chance that we can actually retrieve x. So that is how they explain in the video also. And that is the reason, big uh, like the, the taking determinant is just to show that volumetric transformation. And we should keep in mind that the volumetric transformation will always <coughs> increase the representation space for the original for the original distribution. Now, coming back. Question. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, sorry. Sorry. So now we have to maximize the likelihood. So to maximize the likelihood, our optimization problem is to minimize the negative likelihood. And taking the log of this, it transforms to uh, this equation over here. Like it's simply like uh, the multiplication gets uh, converted to uh, addition. And uh, so as we are taking negative log likelihood, uh, plus gets converted to minuses, right? And now we we have to optimize this right so for stochastic gradient descent optimization we need to find the first order derivative so that's what this jacobian is the first order derivative now also if you uh, remember i told like for a very small change delta x it's always locally linear transformation right if we zoom into that point very close then the transformers transformation is always linear no matter how that the manifold gets changed uh, overall, right? So this Jacobi, Jacobian actually gives us that transformation, like what exact transformation happens to our basis vector, okay? So, and uh, Jacobian also, uh, and 
This is the Jacobian, and we all have to find out the determinant of this Jacobian. So our computation should be easy. That's one of the first parameter for our uh, any progress model. Like we are designing the models to actually sample fast. So the computation should be easy. Uh, that's why uh, they have pointed out that determinant must be easy to calculate and differentiate for. Now. That in mind, uh, uh, keeping that in mind, uh, so we have to compose a flow, right? And it can be multiple flows, like for example, here x goes to multiple flows and finally represents gets represented through, uh, through the space chain, right? So this uh, multiple flows as represented here, and then the inverse sampling process is represented. To here. So this F1, F2, Fk, there are multiple flows that is happening, or multiple transformation actually happening to the original distribution before we arrive, the, arrive at the best distribution, which is J. Now, uh, that is what it's showing. Uh, it's like uh, this is a uh, flow. According to J, this is the uh, flow it sees first. Then it all the goes all the uh, way back to the function F1x, right? Like for example, when we are applying multiple function, it's like this, right? K minus one till F1 of X. So that's why it is like represented in that way. Here yeah, everyone just first one. Uh, yeah. Uh, each F uh, can be defined function, right? Yeah, each F is a flow. Flow may be function. Different function. Yeah. Different function. Yeah. Different function. Yeah, so this is like how we represented like the, this is the first function is the innermost function, then uh, the last function is the outermost function. So that is like fk to f1 of x. Then similarly, when we're in doing the sampling, we are doing it in the inverse way, like we are going from last flow to the first flow. So that's what uh, is represented here. And uh, this is our objective that we are uh, doing, like uh, minimization on. So we need this one here. Why do we need a multiple way instead of having a one? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So why should we have multiple flows instead of one flow? Now, uh, not sure if it is, uh, this is correct. Now, if we have one flow in a very high dimensional space, then the transformation could be uh, like a combination of many parameters. And those parameters, taking a gradient of those parameters, I don't, we'll uh, get a very huge uh, determinant, uh, sorry, get huge Jacobian matrix. And calculation of that uh, uh, matrix determinant will be very difficult. That's why my, what my thought is. Yeah, you can talk to that. It's just like in normal machine learning or deep learning stuff, they're all that. Having multiple layers is really expressive in this case, right? So um, you can use um, you know, very, one very, very complicated, very big layer. Or you could perhaps control these very small layers and really get the same amount of expression. So that's why uh, typically in neural networks, because you can do the stacking, right? The stacking is the type of ensemble thing that allows you to have a lot of expression in uh, each component, each layer in the stack is actually fairly easy. Okay, so basically here, like what we are gonna achieve, uh, try is uh, like just to combine simple F and then uh, eventually we get to uh, like we will like yeah. realize that complex not much by yeah. just combining it's like a parallel path process. Like instead of having a big complex transformation function, we have small blocks, like small transformation function. When combined together, does the same transformation as the complex function. Great. So, so it goes back to the point that uh, one uh, Jacobian
So in an in actual tree, in the actual model, is the, is the app a neural network or is, is it a, how do we, how do we determine the app? So here they are actually talking about like uh, mathematical models. The neural network part, like uh, actually we speak of uh, training the network comes here actually this side, this slide. Like here we haven't gone to training it. Like here we are just discussing like, what is the uh, op, like what is the objective that we want to optimize, and uh, what we actually want to do? How we do it uh, is actually this real NVP part is explaining like how to achieve that optimization objective efficiently. Uh, here is just giving us the models like what suit the model to actually. I don't think they have explained anything like uh, whether this response should be any networks or not. Like random like like layer, so they yeah. making at least one transform. Yeah, yeah, that's what they say. Like uh, this F1 to FK are multiple flows. So if you consider one flow is one type of transformation, we have like multiple yeah. transformations. Yeah. So I think to answer your question directly, uh, an F, a particular flow, could be characterized by have several neural networks which will be holding them together to get the final state. But each one, each flow could be represented either by a single layer or it could be represented by a whole neural network. So I don't think there's there's a particular point there. Yeah, so actually they point out like why they're using multiple flows. It's easy way to increase expressive mode. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. It doesn't matter whether or not it's a layer or a neural network that's sent to the machine to switch from it because the flow is basically from a whole bunch of modules from together and essentially the actual um, different layers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, yeah. Or different We're just adding a couple more layers that match up to the <laughs> output of one that's composing an even larger neural network, right? Right. So let's say the first part of your flow is, uh, you know, F1, yeah. and then we stack F2 on top of it. Which is the subsequent uh, uh, next layer. And when you do the inverse, obviously you're working backwards, right? You're going through the inverse of F2 and then applying uh, the inverse of F1. So, uh, Once they find 
So, like, if we put each of them to different flows, then uh, what will happen that uh, it will break the nature of autoregressive models that uh, uh, these elements, uh, like determination of these elements, will have no effect on this. Uh, like, every all the uh, uh, like only these blocks will have interdependence, but the other blocks will not have any interdependence. So that breaks the nature of autoregressive uh, models. 
tensions are because they are all I don't quite understand the uh, the equation of the pump. The function or the tensor uh, is equal to the uh, sequence of the function, right? So the so, sorry, sorry, I think so the first line so that F theta of the entire tuple <coughs> oh, okay. is equal to this is what the definition of an element line is always to, right? So it's just saying instead of taking a flow where you put all the input variables, you just have Separate flows for trans, uh, separate functions ah, okay. for trans okay. for each individual yeah. one. Yeah. It's just a, yeah, a definition of what, what an element line is. Ah, I see. So that's why uh, we don't have any interdependence here. And so we have to solve that problem. Uh, so in the real <coughs> uh, paper, uh, so they provided a method to train a neural network and like solve all these problems we have discussed till now. And uh, so, how they did it? Like, uh, let's say we have d dimension. Now we break the d dimension into two parts. So in the video, they explain very intuitively. Like they call one part is left, the other part is right. And basically, like we uh, let's say equally divide them. Like uh, this is a equal divisor into two parts. One part is L, one part is R. Now they call it XL and XR. Uh, now this J uh, for the first part, the representation of the J that we're getting is actually the identity. We are not doing any changes. We are simply passing that XL part to our uh, representation distribution. So what is happening here is that that's why this J here is actually equal to the first half or XL. Like to simplify this, I, if you just write XL, so this XL here, Okay, the first one, like J1, is simply Excel. We are not doing any changes. But the second one, X right, we make it, we make changes to it and we parameterize it with Excel. So the changes that uh, this function shows up changes, like we take the second half of the dimension, then we define a function. I'll tell you what this function is. And uh, this is the parameter, uh, like we are uh, adding this first part, Excel, as a parameter to this function. And similarly, do, we are doing another transformation, that is we are adding to this. And again, we are passing the Excel as a parameter. And these two are actually any arbitrary neural networks. Uh, it could be like any uh, random uh, neural network that is par parameterized by the first half of the dimension. Okay, so now comes the neural architecture training part. So this S theta and T theta, actually uh, the networks that we want to train and their parameters with the first half of the dimension that uh, we did not uh, make any changes when doing the first half of the transformation. Like uh, to make it simpler, like when we have the re final representation, we have to uh, like two parts. One representation which is simply the XL, then other representation is whatever this function outputs. Let's say like this uh, some random representation of X, uh, like maybe we call it some XA or something, some random. So this is the final representation we get from this. Now why they do this? Uh, just to simplify the uh, training process. Now. If you see, if, uh, now if we like take Jacobians of this functions now, now this first one according to x one dimensional, right? X first part like I'll just call it x cell. So let's say this is x cell. So the uh, uh, Jacobian of x cell with respect to x cell, the simply the identity matrix, right? It will be all ones, okay? And then Jacobian of uh, this Shared first part, which is actually Excel, uh, according to XR, which is like we are calling the second part, XR, will be zero because there's no involvement. Right? We don't have any XR in the uh, in the Excel representation, right? Uh, so, are you getting me? Yes, you are. It's very complicated. Is everyone getting? So we're just trying to figure it out. So 
so so that's why like this is excel or in the dairy first order derivative of excel with excel so that's why it's the identity matrix then this is the first order derivative of excel with respect to xr which is simply zero now this term here the first order derivative of this term this equation here with xl which is just simply this this is actually excel so this term here now this this looks complex but it doesn't matter here because here we have the identity matrix here we have zero matrix and now finally the x if you see xr this is the first order derivative of this equation according to xr right so this one becomes just this expression and <coughs> this there is no xr term here so this becomes this part becomes zeros right and we finally have just this expression here as a diagonal matrix right so this becomes a lower triangular matrix now here we have identities this part doesn't matter here we have all zeros now calculating the determinant becomes very easy because we have a we just have to take the element wise uh, sorry diagonal elements multiplication as the determinant and that is what this expression is actually uh showing right so this is identity so up till this part of the triangular matrix just one whatever you way we multiply so finally it comes down comes down to this expression here and which is a diagonal matrix so we just have to multiply whatever this expression is giving us like whatever numerical values we are getting from this expression we just have to multiply them diagonally and that gives us the determinant so finally we solve the uh the optimization issue and we can easily find the result They haven't mentioned that. Okay. 
one to kt we take a uh, uh, deriv a partial derivative of its dimension then we have value for one like uh, a partial derivative of first dimension will only value half have value in the first area then the second one will have the value in the second the third one will have value in the third because other terms become zero So give me a so uh, this and the key can be a arbitrary neural network, right? Yes. So in that case, can we train this neural network? What is the loss function here? What is that loss function? Yeah, this is the uh, this is the loss function that we have already. Uh, yeah, this is what we are trying to uh, optimize. <laughs> that negative log likelihood uh, that we have. This is one. This this. We are minimizing the negative log likelihood so that we maximize the likelihood. So this is actually represented. This uh, optimization objective is actually uh, written here like that. Okay, so here then we train neural network S and T simultaneously, right? Instead of the training individually. Sorry. I mean, it could be in this formula like like S theta multiply X and plus. Theta multiply x. But here we train neural network S and T concurrently, right? Oh, so this is a network, yeah. right? This network yeah. is to get, giving some transformation. Yeah. That transformation is actually multiplied with uh, the second part of the dimension yeah, yeah. and uh, then uh, added with uh, this transformation. Yeah. So it's like uh, we multiply add bias. It's kind of similar thing, but it's, it's at a different level. Yeah. So. My question is how to estimate the neural network parameters? How do you train this S and T? What's the loss function? So this, uh, this is like a data parameter, parameterized element flows. So uh, what I think this particular bolded part means that this neural network is parameterized with the first half of the dimension. Yeah. So this is the parameters here, that initial parameters before we train, right? And this is also the same initial parameters for T neural network before we train. But after we train, gets transformed to some representation. Ah uh, yes, yeah. I, I'm a, my question is how to train this neural network? How to train? Yeah, I think what? it will take the off time, the yeah. neural interest of time has already been fully. So uh, we're gonna stop here and then maybe uh I don't know where you can yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, we'll stop here. Those of you who are in week four, uh, if you're here in the room, please continue to talk about this strategy for week four presentation in Friday. Those in week three, uh, thank you for presenting. Thank you for presenting.